Hey everybody, welcome back. We are on Unit 4, the financial sector. We're going to be studying a graph called the money market here in subunit 4.5. Right from the beginning, I want you to kind of point out to you, we've got an equal sign, the liquidity preference model. The graph that we're going to be learning in this video goes by two names, the money market and the liquidity preference model. Now, I don't love this name, even though it is more common, the money market. Why do I not love it? Because it's different than any other market we have. You see, our currency markets, our loanable funds markets, and our product markets, we can see an exchange taking place between the supplier and the demander. However, in this market, you really can't see an exchange taking place in the real world. However, this day, the liquidity preference model, I think that fits it very well because what this is saying is this is a model which is showing our preference for liquid assets. And what are liquid assets? Hey guys, that's money. That's our M1 assets, currency in circulation and demand deposits. So I think it's best to think of this as a preference for holding some of our financial wealth as money, as completely liquid. Now remember, there's a downside to holding some of your wealth as liquid. And what is that? You're giving up the interest rate or really any return, okay? And the main return we wanna focus on is the interest rate. So when you hold some of your wealth as liquid, M1 assets, you are foregoing the interest rate. That'll be key as we study this model. Now, let's get going with these actual graphs down here. I want you to understand that this one on the far right is the actual money market. This is the one we're building to. What we're gonna be doing is what's called a horizontal summation of two graphs to get our money demand curve, okay? That's an economic term, horizontal summation. You'll get it as we do it, okay? So, transaction demand for money, asset demand for money, we're gonna horizontally sum those to get our money demand curve. The other curve, of course, is a money supply curve, and that's the simpler curve, so we're gonna actually start with that. The money supply curve, the thing that is key that you understand about the money supply curve is that it is vertical, okay? Now, most supply curves that we come in contact with are upward sloping. And what that means is as this variable increases, the quantity supplied increases. There's what we call a direct relationship. Now, for the money supply curve, that is not the case. For the money supply curve, we want to say, think of it as not being sensitive to the nominal interest rate. Another way to say it is the nominal interest rate does not determine the quantity of money supplied. What does determine the quantity of money supplied? The central bank, which is not even part of our graph. It's an exogenous variable. And so since, so since something else outside of our graph determines the money supply, we're going to draw it vertical in relation to the nominal interest rate, showing that it does not change with the nominal interest rate. So let's go ahead and put a vertical line on our graph. There we go. We're going to title that the money supply curve. So the Fed has decided right now at least that this horizontal distance will be the quantity of money supplied. End of story, Fed is determining this. I like to like put my Fed right here, point a little arrow to remind myself, it is the Fed determining the money supply, not the nominal interest rate. Now, let's build that money demand curve. We start off with this thing called the transaction demand for money. This is our demand for money to do basic transactions, to pay our rent, our utility bill, our insurance, to buy food, okay, to do basic transactions. This portion of our money demand is not sensitive to the nominal interest rate, similar to the money supply curve. There is a portion, our transaction demand for money, that is not sensitive to the nominal interest rate. So you can see it is drawn vertical. What determines this portion of our transaction demand for money? At the macro level, it is our national income, okay, and the price level. And if you multiply those together, you will get the nominal GDP. And that's what is often said is determining our transaction demand for money. I don't love saying nominal GDP because I don't think that's something that sticks with students, but I think thinking of it as our national income and the price level should make sense. In other words, bring it down to the micro level, to the individual level. What determines an individual's transaction demand for money? Of course, their income would be one thing. They'll set up a life where there's going to be a certain number of basic transactions they're going to have to do based on their income and the life they set up for themselves. 
And then the prices of the stuff that they buy certainly is going to determine their transaction demand for money. So if we aggregate all individuals together, national income, price level, nominal GDP is determining this amount of our demand for money, not the nominal interest rate. Now, there is another component of the money demand, which is the asset demand for money, okay? This is our demand for the asset money above and beyond our demand for the asset money to do basic transactions. Now, you can notice right off the bat, this one is absolutely sensitive to the nominal interest rate. And what is it? It's downward sloping, which shows an inverse relationship, which means as the nominal interest rate goes up, the, the demand for the asset money above and beyond the demand for the asset, the, sorry, above and beyond the demand for the asset money to do basic transactions is going to decrease. Nominal interest rate increases, our demand for M1 decreases. Nominal interest rate goes down, our demand for M1 increases. Again, asset demand for money, our demand for the asset money above and beyond our demand for the asset money to do basic transactions. Now, let's horizontally sum. So I'm going to take this horizontal distance right here, this horizontal distance right here, and I'm just going to kind of eyeball this thing's about right there. You'll see I'm going to draw this little dashed line, okay? That is supposed to be our transaction demand for money, that horizontal distance. Remember, I'm doing that horizontal sum. Now, I'm going to grab this guy and really think of our vertical axes as being calibrated the exact same. Draw this right over to right there, okay? So that that's about that height right there. That, at this point, nominal interest rate gets so high, our demand for money above and beyond our demand for money to do basic transactions becomes zero above that nominal interest rate. And now I'm ready to do the money demand curve. I'm going to erase this portion, okay? I'm going to make that solid. That part is where I get above that interest rate. And so my only demand for money is my transaction demand for money. However, if that nominal interest rate gets below this, I will start demanding even a little bit more money than what I need to do my basic transactions. And that is my money demand curve. So this distance right here, fully determined by transaction demand for money. If I get more than that, any more than that, any more than that distance, that is my demand for money that is increasing as the nominal interest rate goes down because the opportunity cost of holding money is going down when the nominal interest rate goes down. So there's my equilibrium, if you will. And then we're gonna manipulate that graph in part two. Hope that made sense to you. We'll see you in the next video.